Hello, I am Madi Zoravan from the Hyperlyceum website. In this video, I will explain the history output and the field output in Abacus software. In this tutorial, we will see the differences between history output and field output parameters. Also, I will explain how to create and use history outputs and field outputs in an example model. Stay with me. In this section, we will go to the Abacus software to define the output parameters that are in the history output and the field output sections. In general, the analysis and processing of output parameters is done in the visualization module, but before we do that, in the step module, we will return to the request of the history output and the field output that we need. The point that we have to pay attention to is that the type of output parameters, which are in the history output and the field output, are defined according to our defined step. For example, if we have a coupled temperature displacement step, we can have all the temperature parameters in the output in mind and define them. And if there is another step, we can have the output in accordance with that step in the visualization module. We have to pay attention to this point that our outputs, which are in the history output and the field output, are stored in our work directory and stored as an ODB file. As you can see, our outputs are stored in ODB files here.in general, the field output parameters are the tensors that are schematically illustrated on our geometry. As you can see, our requested field output parameters are in this section and are indicated by this contour. Be by the way, the history output parameters are the parameters that will be illustrated on diagrams. For example, the amount of internal energy is one of our history outputs, which is specified on the diagram. This point is important that Defining the field output in the model is mandatory, and if we do not define a specific field output in our model, the Abacus software will automatically select some defaults. Well, now we want to define the field output as a field output. Well, now we want to learn how to define the field outputs and history outputs, and investigate all the parts and options of these sections. In these two windows you see, there is a variety of options that seem to be similar to each other and I want to explain these to you and investigate them with each other. The first thing that catches the eye in these two windows is that we can see the type of solver and the step type we have here. All the parameters that we can select in these two sections become clear with regard to the type of solver and step. The first option that we have in each of the two windows is related to the domain that each of these contains the parameters that I will explain to you. We have an option in the field output window that is the exterior only option that we do not have in the history output window. Because this option points to the fact that we can only display the tensor values on the elements that we can see, even if the calculations have been done for all the elements. Another thing to note is that in this section, which is common in both windows and is visible, the output parameters are selected. Now, I would like to explain the domain section to you. When we set the domain to whole model, our settings appear as shown. Here, we have an option called output for rebar, which relates to the reinforcement rebars in the shell section. This option allows us to specify whether calculations should be performed for these parts or not. When we enable this option, two choices become available. If we select include, calculations will be performed for the rebars, just like for other parts of the model. Alternatively, if we select the only option, only the values related to the rebars will be calculated and displayed. These settings are exactly the same in the history output window. Another option available here is the output at shell, beam, and layered section points, which allows you to specify which section points will appear in the shell or beam elements. In this section, you can either use the default values or assign specific section points as needed. The next option is include local coordinate directions when available, which is used for directional outputs. This option specifies the coordinate system in which these outputs will be calculated. It is worth noting that this feature is not available in the history output window and is only accessible through the field output manager window.in the next section of the domain. We can put it to set. In this way, we select a section of our whole model or some specific elements and calculate the output parameters in that part of our geometry. When we set the domain to set, all the options in the field output manager remain the same as before. However, in the history output manager, a new option becomes available. Include sensors when available. 
This option is used when the outputs have specific features that can be displayed on diagrams. By enabling this option, we can include these features in the output for enhanced visualization. The next domain is Bolt Load Domain, which is used to analyze the bolt joints and pre-stresses defined in the load module. We can choose the specific joints from this section. The Composite Layup Domain is used when composite layers are defined in the model. This domain allows us to specify outputs for specific layers, either across the entire geometry or for selected layers. Within this domain, several options are available. In the selected point for each ply section, we can choose the calculation points to be located at the top, middle, or bottom of the layers. Similarly, we can select the number of calculation points, either including all the section points or specifying the particular section points we want. Similarly, in the Fastener domain, we can use this option to analyze the forces in the joints. As you can see, the available options are similar to those explained in the previously discussed domains. The key outputs we can select here include the forces and other standard outputs related to the joints. The next domain is the Crack domain, which is only available in the History Output Manager window. In this domain, we can select various crack analysis theories and specify the step in which the residual stress will be evaluated. Sometimes, to determine the possible outputs for joints and various components in the assembly module, we use the Assembled Fastener Set domain. The options available in this domain are similar to those explained in the sections on the previously discussed domains in the History Output window. The General Contact Surface option is used to evaluate the contact parameters in general contact interaction. The next domain, Integrated Output section, is only available in the History Output Request window and is specific to the explicit solver. This domain is used for outputs such as the sum of forces applied to an external surface or the forces between two surfaces resulting from a tie constraint. The next domain is the Interaction domain which is used to examine parameters related to contact. These include contact displacement, contact forces, contact moments, and other parameters resulting from contact and friction. The substructure domain, located in the field output request window, can be used to analyze parameters within structures. If we need to analyze parameters in a specific section of these structures, we can use this domain and select the desired section within this domain. The next domain is the Skin Domain, which is used to analyze the parameters of skins and reinforcement surfaces generated in the Property Module. The next domain is the Stringer Domain, which is used to analyze the parameters of stringers, which are reinforcement bars generated in the Property Module, similar to skins. This domain allows for investigating specific parameters of these stringers. The last domain is the spring slash dashpot Domain, which is only available in the History Output window. It is used in modeling cases where spring stiffness or damping coefficients are defined, and we want to extract stress or strain values associated with them. Now that we've covered the domains, let's move on to the next section, which focuses on frequency. In this section, which is common to both, I will explain the different options available to I in the field output request. If we set the frequency to evenly space time intervals, we specify the number of intervals at which our requested outputs will be calculated and stored. But what does it mean? In this model, I've set the number of intervals to 20. If I go to the visualization module and select the frame selector window, you'll see that the field outputs are calculated and displayed for me in 20 intervals. The next option is Every Time Increment. What does this mean? It means that for every increment in the field output, the results are stored for us. This option provides the highest accuracy among all the available options, but it comes with the trade-off of longer run times and increased calculation costs. The next option in the frequency settings is Every X Units of Time. This means that, for example, if the time unit in our model is seconds, it will store the outputs every X seconds. The next option is from time points. With this option, the outputs will be stored based on the time points we've defined. For example, we can set a start time, an end time, 
and increments, specifying the time points at which we want to store the field output data. Another option in this section is the timing option. By selecting certain frequencies, this option becomes active. It includes two output choices, at approximate times and output at exact times. If we want our outputs to be accurate based on the selected times, we can use the exact times option. On the other hand, if we prefer the outputs to be based on approximate times, we can use the output at approximate times option. These are the options I've explained in the field output request window. Similarly, the same options are available in the edit history output request window, where you can use them to configure the settings for your model. The last option in the edit field output request window is element output position. This option specifies where within the element the output values will be saved. It includes several choices. The centroidal option calculates the outputs at the geometric center of the element, making it suitable for situations where the outputs are evenly distributed across the element. The integration points option, which is the default, calculates the outputs at the integration points of the elements. The nodes option stores the outputs at each node of the specific element. Finally, the averaged at nodes option stores the output data and averages it across all the nodes of the element. We have reviewed all the sections and options available in the edit field output request and edit history output request windows that we encounter. It is important to note that these settings and configurations depend on the solver being used. If a different solver is selected instead of the explicit solver, which was used as an example here, there may be slight changes in the available options. However, the overall structure of the options will remain as explained. Now, to provide a more comprehensive analysis, I will show you the options I've selected for our model and investigate them together in the visualization module.in this model. I've used the 20 interval field output request and for the entire model, I've selected output parameters such as stress components, various strain-related parameters, displacement, forces, and contact-related parameters. For the history output, I have only requested parameters related to energy, including internal energy and kinematic energy. Afterward, I will go to the visualization module to illustrate these parameters to you. As I've mentioned and explained earlier, the field output parameters, in terms of tensors and schematics, can be selected from this section. For example, I will set the output to PEQ. And as you can see, the equivalent plastic strain tensor will be displayed schematically on the deformed model. Now, if needed, I can set this parameter to you and the displacement values for this model will be shown. I can also select the stress parameter and apply the Mises criterion to calculate the stress values, which will then be illustrated schematically on the deformed sheet, formed using the deep drawing method. However, if I want to investigate whether the process is quasi-static, I will use the history output parameters that I requested. As I explained in the previous lectures, if the ratio of the total amount of kinematic energy to the total internal energy in our model is below 10% at the end of the simulation, we can conclude that the simulation is quasi-static. To investigate this, I plot the internal energy diagram and overlay the kinematic energy diagram. As you can see, at the end of the simulation, the total amount of kinematic energy is less than 10% of the internal energy. As a result, I can conclude from these history output parameters that my simulation is in a quasi-static state. This is one example of how history output is used in our model and abacus simulations. Thank you for being with us. I hope this video was useful for you.